morning and a very warm welcome again to um, the WIGH for those of you who have been before. For those who haven't, welcome for the first time and I hope this is the only time we will see you here. Although I have to acknowledge that this is a very special day. It's Obi's birthday. Oh, I won't ask you. <laughs> I would ask you to say the happy birthday. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Maybe, okay. Maybe later. Not, not just yet. Um, but also his valedictory um, oration will be very grandiose about it. Um, Obi has the record of being the longest serving fellow um, with UNU. Um, and he has quite a bit to say about it. He has a totally illustrious CV. If I, if I start reading what I've been given to read about him, um, I think there's, there's a few people all wanting to say something and it will take the whole morning. Um, so I will hand over to Professor Takeuchi, who um, is from uh, one of Obi's earlier um, colleagues. Um, who will formally introduce him for this seminar. Uh, Professor? Uh, hello, uh, from uh, Tokyo. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, we can. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, congratulations, Obi, for uh, finalizing your job at uh, UNO IIGH. I have been collaborating with you for many years, particularly I remember that when you are working at the, the headquarters uh, of the UNU. Uh, we uh, discuss a lot and we travel a lot. And uh, it was uh, my privilege that I could nominate you and upgrade you to be at, uh, one of the uh, section head uh, on uh, international uh, development and cooperation. Uh, I still remember that uh, we will have a very good time in Africa as well as in uh, uh, South America. We went together to the Trinidad and Tobacco uh, to attend a very interesting uh, a meeting organized by the UNU. And uh, also recognize that uh, he has been a very uh, unique career of combining of uh, global health issues with uh, uh, governance issues. And his position is quite unique because he is a, a low background. And therefore, I very much appreciate that uh, you father could uh, uh, work at the UNU IIGH and contribute a lot for the development of uh, uh, global health. And now uh, we are now developing this idea to the planetary health, uh, which is a combination of climate change issues with the global health issues. And so I uh, congratulate that you uh, completed your term at both UNU ISP as well as the UNU IIGH. And uh, uh, looking forward that uh, you could further uh, develop your career. I wish you all the best for your future endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And the first of your congratulations, Obi. Um, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I hope. everybody. I, um, I hope we can make this um, as informal as possible. Um, first and foremost, when I was asked to do a valedictory oration, I didn't know what it meant. Um, <laughs> do I come in here and say goodbye? And uh, do I give a seminar? Do I, uh, so, you know, I mean, so I have to, but that's good, you know, I have a discretion to structure it the way I want, you know, to say what I want to say. Um, First, I would like to uh, congratulate um, 
uh, also was Bakauchi, who uh, basically was um, my supervisor um, for years in Tokyo at the headquarters, uh, then uh, at the UNU ISP, but, uh, uh, that's the name of the institute that, you know, when I was there. Um, that's part of what I'm going to talk about in this 12 year sojourn uh, at uh, UNU. Protokauchi uh, was one of those um, very dedicated Japanese um, academics who actually gave so much to UNU in terms of um, you know what he did in, in convincing the um, the Japanese uh, bureaucrats at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan you know to continue to support you know UNU in very you know um, very positive uh, terms. Um, I um, also would like to. Uh, pay tribute to um, some people that are not here, the UN director himself, David Malone, um, who gave me the opportunity to, to come here in 2013 uh, when I finished my six year time in Tokyo. So he said, you know, I find you what you are doing unique. You are a lawyer doing global governance, global health, international development. I want you to go to Kuala Lumpur and help to build the institute there. You spent six years in Tokyo. So I appreciate that opportunity. I wish um, he was available today for me to, you know, to say to him. I've been communicating with him by email anyway, so he knows that my time was, is coming to an end. Um, also, uh, just yesterday, I got a very interesting email from um, uh, Max Bond, another very interesting uh, individual, who I told him when I responded yesterday that um, there's no human being that is alive who knows you and you, you more than him. You know, uh, he spent more than 30 years as uh, mainly as the chief executive uh, officer in the rector's office. He has worked with about five rectors. You know, he knows one of the past rectors described him as the soul of the institution, the soul of the of UNU. So it is uh, it's very heartwarming. You know, he left UNU a couple of years ago for him to send this email and said, "I have from the grapevine that you are it was a farewell for you today." Um, I don't know where he where he is. You know, but he's somewhere. You know, so. Uh, it's very hard for me to receive those kinds of messages, you know, uh, from people who uh, have um, worked together you know, in these past 12 years. Um, when Pascal chose 29th of August, and for me to do this, he, he, she kept pushing, and I said, it's so close to my departure date. But I knew, I had a sense why she was pushing for 29th. So today is my birthday. <laughs> so, it doesn't mean the best of celebrations in the midst of uh, all of these, uh, you know, closing boxes and you know, um, uh, packing up your office and home and getting ready to, to get on the on the airplane. But uh, I appreciate that. You know, thank you very much for um, you know your birthday wishes. So what I'm going to do um, uh, is quickly to is this is a reflection, okay, um, about um, you know uh, my 12-year uh, sojourn at uh, at uh, a UNU. Um, and I think, you know, I think I have to start by, you know, those, those three questions. When, where, how did it start? You know, how did the journey start? Um, 1st of September 2007, I was uh, appointed uh, Academic Program Officer and Director of Studies, Policy and Institutional Frameworks in the um, Peace and Governance Program at the UN, uh, UN Headquarters in Tokyo. Um, I was just a conventional academic. You know, teaching international law, global governance. Um, you know, as um, as a professor of uh, law and legal studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, in Canada. Um, when I saw this, you know, this uh, uh, job ad at the UNU, um, I I tell people informally, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, jokingly that if anybody told me um, maybe by 2006 that I was going to spend six years of my life in, in Japan and another six years in Kuala Lumpur. I would have told the person, I think you are, I don't think you are, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's, that's, the, that's the journey of life, you know. Sometimes we cannot predict, you know, where Providence takes you. So I saw this interesting position and um, I didn't know anything about UNU. I knew so much about Ramesh Thakur, um, another intellectual, you know, figurehead who um, was very prolific you know, on peace and governance issues, UN reform, um, you know, those kind of, you know, UN studies. Um, you can't, you can do, you can Google him, you know, you can't, uh, I don't think there are more than five scholars in the world uh, who actually has, uh, you know, have written more than him on UN reform and security council issues. 
So he was very prominent, and I'm not a political scientist, you know. I, you know, I, there's uh, some of you might just lump us together, say oh, law and international and international relations. They are two different. They are worlds apart. So, um, so he's a political scientist. He's an international relations expert. But sometimes when I teach international law or UN studies, um, I come across some of his writings. So that's the much I knew. He was a senior vice rector at UNU at that time. Um, that's the only thing I knew about UNU. But he was heading the um, the peace and governance program. So he was the person who actually was trying to recruit, you know, for this position. He's Indian, uh, by the way. He's uh, the he's a very 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 close friend of Kofi Annan, and he he single-handedly wrote Kofi Annan's UN reform report. You know, uh, if you pick up that report, every single word there was written by Ramesh Thakur. So they're very very close, you know. Um, so he. Um, so I applied for the for the post, and um, when I was uh, coming for an interview, then he was uh, about to finish his term. He was about to finish his term as senior vice rector. Um, so at the interview, the questions uh, he you know he's uh, he's a hard puncher, you know, um, and uh, most people that I knew um, who told me things about him, uh, you know, told me that that's how he likes to provoke, you know, debates. Even when you are saying the right thing, he pushes you the wrong direction to see what you say. So I came out of the interview. I said, "Oh, I thought, thought I did horribly." You know, um, this guy was asking so many questions. Um, anyway, the um, uh, eventually, I, I, you know, they, they, they offered me the position, and I left Ottawa um, in August 2007. And as I came to Tokyo, he was actually leaving. So it was a transition. So he was finishing his time as senior vice rector. He's now based in uh, Adesia, um, the Asia Pacific School of Public uh, of uh, Diplomacy at uh, ANU in Canberra. So he was leaving uh, UNU at that time, and we basically overlapped by just a few weeks. You know, as I was coming in, he was you know just exiting the building. Um, so at that time, the academic program at the UNU headquarters was just structured. There was no institute. We just had two programs. The Peace and Governance Program and the Environment and Sustainable Development Program. It used to be one program, but um, I heard that some years ago, uh, Ramesh Patna himself suggested that, you know, um, uh, instead of having just one program, which is on peace and governance, you know, why don't we also put in uh, environment and sustainable development so that the, um, the scientists, you know, environmentalists and, you know, people who do like climate change kind of work can focus on that. Why the Peace and Governance Program will focus on issues like UN reform, human rights, and those kind of things. Um, so there were basically two vice rectors, uh, one in charge of peace and governance program and one in charge of uh, environmental and sustainable development uh, uh, program. Uh, there was also a UNU Institute for Advanced Studies that is based in Yokohama, um, very close to Tokyo, uh, which was uh, at that time led by a very prominent Malaysian, most of you in the room we know, um, um, Professor Zachary, who, um, is, um, uh, who was the immediate uh, past prime, science advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia and chair of a UNU IIGH Board of Advisors. So this was what it looked like, you know, the two programs and then the institute, which was in Yokohama actually, you know. Um, so this was the, the, the structure in which I was recruited into. Um, now this man here is uh, one of the, um, the, uh, the past uh, rector, Hans van Ginkel, is a um, Dutch uh, geographer, very highly respected um, geographer from, uh, from the Netherlands. He was UNU rector from 1997 to 2007, and um, again another transition. He was he worked with uh, Ramesh Taku. Ramesh was his vice, was senior vice rector. He was director at that time. And as I was coming, you see, uh, his term ended in 2007. I basically overlapped with him by just two days. So I arrived from Tokyo, and I came into the told him, you know, at the UNU. That was the handover of the rectorate. You know, he was you know living. Um, but I met him when I came for an interview, um, around March, April, uh, when I came for, for an interview. I interacted with him, um, he talked to all the candidates and, you know, um, basically what, what struck me about him is this is a UNU rector, USG, and there's a recruitment process going on for, um, for a fairly, you know, mid-career position, you know, um, and, and I guess there were about seven or eight of us listed, but he sat down and read everybody's CV. And he's not part of the process. So each of the candidates after the interview would just go and say hello to him as the rector. So when I came to see him, um, just for five minutes, he started asking me some questions about my CV. You know, and I was like, wow. <laughs> this is a... So he said, I have nothing to do with the process, but I find your CV interesting, and there's something I find there about what you did at WHO. You know, so we had a discussion. 
So, very a positive mind, you know, and um, he was really a leader, an academic leader. He was very well beloved in Japan. Everybody liked him, the ambassadors, the diplomatic community, Japanese, um, you know, the, the, the Imperial Palace. After he finished, he was given, I think, the highest national honor that is given to a foreigner by, by you know, by the, by the, um, the Emperor of Japan. So, um, so this is Van Ginkel, um, who basically, I would say, you know, recruited me, but, you know, left as I, as I arrived. So immediately I arrived, uh, the next day was the handover of the rectorate, okay? So Van Ginkel hands the baton to um, uh, Conrad Osterwalder from a Swiss, uh, you know, uh, a physicist who had arrived from the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and resumed the same day I resumed, 1st of September. 2007. So you could see the, you know, <laughs> the, the, all of this. So, um, so Van Ginkel left and then he took over on uh, basically the first day I started, you know, he also started on 1st of September. Um, so he, um, so there was, there was this standover between uh, of the electorates. And immediately I, um, asked while that, you know, sat down to business, the first thing he did in a few months was to say that you know he wanted to match the um, uh, peace and governance program with the environment and social development program these two program academic programs in tokyo he wanted to match them into an institute also they brought them together because he said i don't like the way people work you know the peace and governance people um uh, basically don't work closely with the environment and social development people you know so um so we have to create an institute and make sure that you know um you know we cross over we cross the boundaries of the other so this was what the structure looked like. Um, so this new institute, uh, Protakauchi headed, at that time, um, when Conrad Osterweiler was uh, rector, um, I think six months after his, uh, his, um, uh, his inauguration, he recruited Protakauchi and uh, Governor Tamparayo as his vice rectors. And uh, one of, you know, when they arrived, um, he proposed the margin of these two programs to create a new institute for sustainability and peace. So that's where the name came from, because peace and governance, sustainable development and, and, uh, and the environment. So they wanted to make sure that you know, they capture what the two programs were doing. Um, so there were three pillars of the, um, of the Institute. Um, peace and security, uh, which basically was doing the kind of thing that uh, peace and governance program was doing. Then the global change and, uh, global change and sustainability program, which was dealing basically with you know, um, the uh, environment and sustainable development program. Now, the innovative thing was to create the international cooperation and development, and that's what Protocolchi was just talking about. So I was the section head for that. And what that meant was that um, uh, this ICD was supposed to link the two programs. Because whatever you do, uh, whether it's you go to fix conflict societies and create you know, post-conflict peace building and things like that, you need development. If you want to address climate change, adaptation and mitigation and all of this, it's development. So the, um, the, um, the ICD section was supposed to be the bridge that, you know, that um, created that um, you know, cross-disciplinary um, work between the two, the two other sections. So we had three section heads you know, for, for each of these sections, and I was uh, uh, in charge of the uh, International Cooperation and Development uh, section. Now, um, Conrad Osterwalder, you know, um, pushed you and you had, you know, towards becoming a, a degree granting institution. Um, and we're going to talk about this, you know, there's a whole, whole lot of debates about this. Um, you know, when you call something a university, you know, what's, what do universities do? We all know what universities do uh, all over the world. Um, so maybe we shouldn't have had UN university in the first place if we cannot do you know, uh, grant degrees. You would have called it something else. It would have been doing what it's doing now. It could have been UN Research Institute or something, you know. But when you call it a university, so some people, and when you travel around the world, you still you get that question. But my colleagues here who are the research fellows, you know, who we go to meetings everywhere, in Europe, North America, Africa, the first question is, you are from UN, United Nations University. Oh, how many students do you have? You know, can we have, a, you know, those kind of, you know, yeah. You don't blame them, you know, because, when you call something a university, that's something it should be, you know. So even in the minds of Japanese people, Japanese senior bureaucrats in the Ministry of Education, they kept pushing, you know, because yeah, they're putting a lot of money for UNE. And to them, well, the think tank function is very good. They're not saying it's not a uh, but they, 
they are confused. This is not what universities should do. You know, they want to see students come there, do masters, you know, graduate, get you know, certificates, move on, you know, to work in the, you know, in the, this. So, uh, so they are the ones who wanted it. It wasn't just an Oscar Wilde and the Japanese pushed for it, you know, because I was in Tokyo. I was privy to when these discussions were were going on. Um, but um, so so the. Yeah, it was so difficult to amend the UNU uh, charter, you know, to, to be able to have that degree uh, granting authority. There were issues about accreditation, you know, who is going to accredit UNU degrees. It's not just starting a degree that is a problem, but, you know, we know how universities program, university programs are accredited, you know, in countries. Um, so it was a very nerve-wracking, you know, uh, time because he pushed it so quickly and we went to New York, did all the diplomatic lobbying to get the General Assembly to change, you know, just one clause in the UN which has, you know how this is, you know, uh, to change is in any of these special documents takes you, you know, ages. So anyway, he got it done and he quickly introduced degree programs in Tokyo. Um, the master's degree in sustainability development and peace and the PhD program in sustainability science. Um, he also pushed for what he called, you know, creation of the twin institutes. Um, and what he meant by this was to, that if you look at, we will see, there's a slide on this, you know, the 14 UNU institutes and programs are starting now, you know, because of the growth of the world in Spain. If you look at where they're located, you know, and you look at where the problems of the world, whether it's development or, you know, conflict or whatever, anything you want to talk about, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, um, so it's considered in Europe, the developed, you know, uh, destiny, and then of course Japan is the headquarters. So there's always this issue, you know, um, about what UNU is doing for the underdeveloped or developing countries. So the presence of UNU. So what he came up with the idea that you know, um, an institute based in in uh, Maastricht, for instance, in the uh, Netherlands, should have a twin partner in a developing country, not like a full institute, but you know, you have to have think about how you can do it, you know. So, um, that this was going to, you know, strengthen UNU's presence in developing countries and transition, transitional countries, and also intensify research and teaching. So if you have a twin sister or a twin brother in, a, in Africa or somewhere, um, of course you have to give, you don't forget your twin, you know, you have to give him or her a helping hand. So institutes like WIDA actually did it well. Uh, I think they have something in Ghana uh, that is still running. Um, it was set up based on this twin idea, and one of the one of the research fellows is based in uh, in, uh, in Ghana. Uh, Maastricht had an institute in um, a twin institute in Senegal, you know, um, you know. So there were uh, there were you know things like that um, that uh, happened. So, but anyway, the the twin institute idea was not fully, you know, the, it wasn't fleshing that. Um, people we we asked questions, you know, because I was in Tokyo then. I was head of you know a section. So what do we want to have a clear description of you know how to twin? Twin it can mean different things. You know, it doesn't mean just going to organize you know workshops and uh, programs in Accra or in, uh, in in Nairobi. You know, um, or what are the financial implications involved? You know, so when you twin, does it involve? So it wasn't clearly defined, but the rector at that time, Oscar Wilder, had was pushing for it, and he had you know his own um, uh, ideas you know about. Um, you know what uh, doing it meant. Now, um, the present boss, uh, Dr. Malone, um, Canadian, um, you know, highly rated Canadian diplomat, one ambassador to India, um, president of IDRC. He resumed as a UN director first of March 2013. Um, so you could see my journey, um, having worked with basically with three rectors, um, um, you know, and each handover of the rectorate comes with challenges, you know, because it all depends on the strategic direction that that particular rector wants to, you know, wants to push. Um, the issue of the way that academic programs and teaching programs were, 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 were actually established, you know, um, very ad hoc, uh, it wasn't planned out. I know I sat in some of those meetings and I gave examples about, look, you know, where my university in Canada, when we wanted to start, start a PhD program, it took us five years to plan. It's not just writing the, the, you know, you can write out the, the guidelines and how many credit students can take or whatever. But you know, human resources. If you have 15 full-time faculty, you know, 15 full-time faculty, and you have a master's program that is actually, of course, the graduate is there, you know, for this thing. 
you can't just sustain a PhD program with that. You know, it's too small. So what my, my university did was to say, okay, let's give a, let's do a five-year plan. We have to get the budget, make sure that every, every year we get at least two full-time assistant professors. So in the next five years, I'm going to have 10 faculty members added. And this, this will be young and mid-career people who are going to be there for, you know, uh, this thing. But in uh, at uh, UNU uh, ISP, for instance, we just have four academic uh, program officers, four research fellows. How are we going to do this? You know, supervise masters and PhDs teach, still do our think tank function, you know. So nobody was against it. You know, what we said was, you know, it needs to be, you know, planned, you know, properly, it needs to be a lesson. But he wanted it because he wanted to make it his legacy, you know. Um, so when, when Dr. Malone resumed, um, I guess from, you know, his briefing, um, he, uh, New York wasn't very happy with, the, with that, you know, that UNU was uh, moving towards becoming a teaching, you know, uh, university. Um, and at that time, there were all these, you know, um, master's programs that had been started. The one in Tokyo, Maastricht actually has, you know, a good program. Um, and most other institutes were being pushed to, if you don't have the capacity, look for a local university and get it done. And that's, that's like the rector's uh, message. Look for a local university, you have to get it done. <laughs> so, um, so Dr. Malone actually scaled back that. Um, of course, the, the, one, the program in Tokyo is still running. You can't, um, it has just been, uh, the Japanese like that. And the University of Tokyo actually, you know, offers a lot of, you know, um, they, they have a good partnership. So his message is that he thinks that you know, um, the feelers he got from New York is that UNU should, you know, should go back to, you know, and, you know, re-strategize and refocus on this think tank function. He wants to see UNU visible in policy debates in New York, in Geneva. You know, these are the places where, you know, some of the issues that are within, uh, within the UNU mandate are being discussed by, you know, UN institutions and diplomats and, you know, senior government officials. Um, so we should be able to go back to that, that role. Um, so he scaled back the teaching. He didn't, you know, abolish it. Like I said, you know, the one in Tokyo is still running. Um, the, the institutes that actually have gotten teaching right, masters and PhDs, like Maastricht, is always a very good example. But because they are very much, you know, part of the Maastricht, you know, um, Institute for, for Social Governance or something like that at the University of Maastricht. And this has been a very excellent, happy marriage that has gone on for years, for decades. You know, um, so not all the UN institutes have that kind of, you know, that kind of um, advantage that uh, Maastricht has with uh, the University of uh, of, uh, of uh, Maastricht. Um, so the he um, wanted to refocus uh, UNU as uh, as a think tank, and um, if you look at the strategic uh, plan, uh, 2015 to 2019 is on the UNU website. Um, you see what is written clearly there. It's very, very, uh, you know, very clear. That's why I highlighted those in, uh, in red. Um, yes, those who have gotten the teaching programs uh, right, you can go ahead and do it. Um, but he felt that, um, you know, uh, graduate programs were actually pushing you and you away from its uh, core uh, mission and mandate. Um, so he has, there's a whole lot of, you know, um, uh, memos that have gone to the um, the uh, you know the institute directors that passed in that you know passed down to the to the staff fellows about the think tank function and what what um, you know uh, directorate now wants uh, UNISTs to do. Um, one of the things that he did as well was um, uh, again that was the the, the the UNUIS in Yokohama and this new the the UNUISQ. He also brought them together. You know, uh, part of the, the the reason is that there's so much duplication between the two institutes. Uh, you know what the ISP is doing and what IS, IS is doing. And then, if you look at the distance of Tokyo and, and Yokohama, it's just like 45 minutes on the train. Why would you have a, an institute there that is working on sustainable development issues, climate change, and those kind of things, and then have another institute in Tokyo that is also you know doing the same thing? So. Uh, cost saving measure and also to streamline the, uh, the programs and activities. So he proposed that and brought them together and that's why you now have the UNU Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability. So the, the current UNU IS in Tokyo um, came out of you know uh, the merger of UNU ISP and UNU IS in uh, Yokohama and this is from their website you know so um, 
So you can see that in the part in the, in the, in the uh, within a space of you know uh, eight years, you know, there's a whole lot of you know mergers and you know um, um, refocusing and revitalizing and all of this that um, uh, that went on at uh, at the UNU. So um, so that's it about the structure in Tokyo that where I worked. Um, but we cannot talk about this institute since this is you know this is a 12-year you know surgeon. Um, and you know, it's about the the UNU, not just um, you know what happened in Tokyo. Um, we do know, you know, the um, anybody who has you know done just a bit of research about UNU uh, should know about this man, uh, Yutant, uh, the um, the um, then bomber, but now Myanmar, the uh, Secretary General of the UN from 1961 to 1971. <coughs> so he was the the architect. You know the, the the person who actually you know um, 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 recommended very strongly to the UN General Assembly uh, that he wanted uh, a UN a UN United Nations University. Um, this was in 1969 when he made this proposal, and part of the debate at the General Assembly, I will um, there's a book here which um, I think I don't know whether the, the copy is still available. This is. A concise history. If you read this, you know everything about this whole debate at the General Assembly. Is here. You know how, what people said, why the, what the General Assembly said, why you know all the questions, and you know why do you need a university? Um, does the UN, you know, can the UN set up a university? You know, those kind of questions. Why do we need one? Anyway, um, what what the concern of Utahns was that, you know, some of us have been in the uh, in the uh, in the um, in the forum, the international forums, where you know uh, negotiations have been made, uh, whether it's for a treaty or an agreement or even something that is non non legally binding, you know, there's all kinds of codes of conduct and you know um, resolutions and declarations at WHO, at the General Assembly of the UN, you know, in all these uh, UN forums, you find that you know uh, there's a whole lot of politics involved. Every country comes with its own you know uh, interests. Strategic interest, economic interest, whatever you know, and this is what guides diplomats. If you if you look at you know a typical debate at the General Assembly in New York, you know, um, he plays out there. So I think to that he was frustrated that you know too much politics was getting involved in UN decision decision making. Okay, so can we have a neutral think tank that will help us, you know, to make informed decisions? On some of these, you know, global issues. This was 1969, so he had that this thing, that there was a lot of politics. The decisions are not made based on, you know, um, you know, the common interests of humanity or, or, or societies, but you know, based on the uh, interests of countries. So, so the first thing he said was that okay, well, that, that is a new type of university. It, to respond to that argument, to that objection, oh, why do, why does the UN, you know, because we want to it to me. That you want to stop a university that will, you know, grant masters and PhDs, the what conventional universities do. So he called it. This is actually from the from the, his proposal, 1969, a new type of university that was going to promote international, you know, uh, scholarly cooperation and undertake, you know, problem-oriented, uh, multidisciplinary research on urgent global on issues of urgent global concern and strengthen research and development and training in developing countries. So this was his original proposal. Um, Eventually, after you know nothing gets done easily uh, in, at the UN, uh, it took about three years, you know, to for the General Assembly to decide to um, approve, you know, his uh, his recommendation. Uh, UNU was created in 1972, um, again with those, you know, some of those words are from the original proposal by by Utans. and. Um, uh, so it does all of this, you know. This is from the UN chat, the UNU charter. Um, so there are there are five key roles. If you go by what the General Assembly uh, uh, approved in that uh, declaration, um, so I've marked um, the the two most important roles that have taken everybody's time. Uh, if you are searching for that UNU, these are the questions that will be, you know, that um, you have to grapple with. Um, think tank, as far as the UNUIGH is the global health think tank for the for the UN the UN system. Um, building capacity for developing countries. 
So these are the two most important ones. It doesn't mean that these are the only ones. We all do other things, convening authority and all of that, you know. But um, these are the two uh, prominent ones that actually, even if you go back to the strategic plan, the, this, uh, the UN strategic plan for, um, that I, I just quoted from, the current strategic plan, it talks about these two things, you know. Um, so the debate that you want to influence, you know, or shape in New York or Geneva or in some of these, you know, uh, major hubs, uh, major UN, UN hubs, um, you do that because you're a think tank in the UN system. Uh, each of the 14 institutes uh, has its own mission. So I would expect that, you know, as uh, IIGH, we will be more, you know, involved in what happens in Geneva, WHO, and as well, you know, in New York when those were uh, health issues. Um, so the second is building capacity, which, again, you know, um, there's a huge basket. A lot of things can go into capacity building. So how do you do it? There's no one way of doing capacity building. You know, but these are the these are the two, you know, um, the two uh, key um, 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 uh, issues in that mandate. Now, UN has enjoyed um, autonomy um, within the UN, uh, academic freedom. We publish what we want. We uh, so long as it's based on sound, you know, intellectual, you know, uh, reason and evidence. Um, you don't get permission from anybody, you know, if you um, if you do a, do, a, do a project and you know um, uh, there's an output that is coming from that, uh, whether it's a policy brief or or, um, or an article or, or a book project, so um, so that academic freedom is respected. So that makes that makes when you gives you any some autonomy in terms of you know uh, doing that uh, think tank function. Um, yeah, in fact, some of the. UNU publication that I that I, I saw when I was in Tokyo, um, most of them from uh, um, from Amishtaku, were very critical, very very critical of, of the UN. So, for instance, there's um, there's one of these. I brought uh, a few of them here. There's one of one of these, the unintended consequences of UN peacekeeping operations. Very very critical. You know what peacekeepers do in you know conflict situations. Uh, you send the peacekeepers to, to, to help to protect the population, vulnerable population, and they go in there, they start, you know, there's, you know, uh, cases of rape and, you know, uh, sexual assault and violence against innocent uh, women, for instance. All of those things are documented, and this is, uh, so, so there's the, all the good intentions when you send out peacekeepers to this uh, problem uh, spots, okay? But there's a consequence we don't intend, which is, you know, this kind of things, you know, maybe, you know, gender-based violence and things like that. Um, they've done quite a lot of this kind of, you know, this kind of, uh, of studies. So, so that's, that's, that's the beauty of, of UNU, you know, that um, you can actually, you are, you are a UN institution, you're a UN think tank, but also you have academic freedom to be able to, to do critical work that will make the UN to improve. That's actually what, you know, what, what uh, uh, think tanks do. Um, I, I talked briefly about this, the global spread of, uh, of a UN institute. So if you look at, for instance, the African region, there's just one, um, is one um, presence, you know, in, um, in uh, right here, the UN era in Ghana. Um, so the whole of the, that, the, the continent basically looks at this, but if you look at, you know, um, most of them are, so that's, that's what Ostawada was, you know, trying to, uh, to, to address. Uh, through the twin institutes. So if you could actually get um, some of those institutes in Europe to have, you know, to establish twin institutes or twin outposts in uh, the, developed, the developing countries, that would actually enhance uh, UNU's uh, visibility in, that, uh, in those places. Now, um, so we do basically, just a summary, these this three things, you know, um, research and policy studies, teaching and capacity development, <coughs> Convening outreach, you know, um, we do all of this, um, and I'm, I'm sure if you do an audit of any of the institutes, you know, you can tick the boxes um, of how they how they do each uh, any one of those. Um, we um, so in ISP, for instance, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that before where I spent six years there. So um, uh, so I was very much part of the uh, part of the uh, the core academic team. Um, so we focused on. Because of the nature of the of the those three programs, um, most of the research we did would focus on pressing issues within the UN the UN agenda, um, and then we have to ask the question: Is it policy relevant? 
we don't just do research, you know, for research sake, um, you know. So, but it has to address, a, you know, the policy um, um, gap. That um, and with clear cut recommendations. So, if you look at, so for instance, uh, a project that actually lead to some of these kind of books that uh, you know, um, the peace and governance program initiated. Uh, the the one on peacekeeping, for instance, they will have very clear guidelines on how to prevent that from happening in the future. So you make these recommendations, how it is, whether it is taken up in, you know, in, in, in policy debates in, uh, in New York is a different question altogether. So you can, you have to get it done first and then think about how to disseminate it and then what uh, the director's office call uh, now, uh, research uptake, you know, uh, you have to look at, you know, the, 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 uh, whether, you know, um, these recommendations fit into, you know, the policy debates uh, of the relevant UN uh, agencies. So how? We never do anything by ourselves, you know. There's always a collaboration. Um, that's why when you're working in developing countries, you don't know the terrain is very complex. You need somebody, you know, you need an institution that, uh, that knows the, you know, knows the, you know, the, 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 the local context uh, that can help to, to plan, to, you know, to organize the, the workshop. So um, the last bullet point, um, very, 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 you know, interesting because each time, each time we did the fact when we do a project watch um, um, proposal before it is approved, um, you have to actually address that question. So it's not just geographical, but gender is very important. You can't have 15, 15 participants in a workshop and and the 14 of them are male and just one female at this So it's not uh, this thing. So at that point, before the workshop is approved proper, you have to actually make sure that there's there's uh, at least gender balance. The other mainstream is another thing, is a different thing from, but at least even when you count the numbers, it has to, you have to have enough, you know, a good balance uh, between the, uh, between gender and there. Um, we, we did quite a lot, you know, this is just like, uh, I was watching this thing last night, you know, when I was trying to do this, you know, so, uh, but these are just examples, you know, of, uh, of uh, the classes we collaborated uh, within the six months that I, six years that I was there. There were, there were other, others that I couldn't find, but this, uh, the ones that come to mind. Um, so for outputs in uh, international peace and security, it was quite, I have to say, that you know, um, it was a very, very, very you know, um, busy and active you know, um, academic agenda, research uh, uh, agenda at, uh, at ISP. Uh, most times, you know, these things were done even within a year. Um, uh, this is so um, the, um, the, the, the good thing that actually we enjoyed was the fact that, you know, even that time that Professor Ramesh Thakur left, he had actually set up a lot of very good network internationally. So it's just a question of people were coming to us, asking us, you know, to do projects with us. And, you know, so we were able to produce all of this, um, you know, within a, within a you know, short space of time. So these are, these are some of the examples of what the, international, the, the peace and security section did. And, um, this um, also came from uh, the governance uh, work that you know the institute uh, ISP did. You see the outputs; it's quite uh, so. Uh, the um, this focused on um, you know climate change and ecosystem uh, adaptation research, uh, the UN CSR program, which was um, one of the initiatives of Akauchi. Um, had very, it was very well funded by the Japanese, uh, I, I think, I believe, Minister of Environment. But um, it wanted to create a very strong network in, uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific region. So they had quite um, good collaboration with institutes in uh, Sri Lanka, in Vietnam, in Indonesia. Uh, very active and a lot of meetings in Tokyo. Um, then we um, also, uh, that was there was also um, UNU era was involved at some point. But then I remember I went to one of the meetings in Accra on um, on uh, ecosystem uh, and system adaptation. Then um, this came from also from the um, some of the climate change work that we did. Um, so this is a very good example of where those three sections, ICD peace and security and uh, uh, environmental change and sustainability came together nicely. Because for instance, um, if you, one of our colleagues who was in peace and security then was working on 
you know, to alleged victims, which was a very innovative you know, lesson at that time. And um, for instance, the climate change diplomacy in small islands was what I did with um, some of the countries in, uh, in the Caribbean. I remember that we had a workshop at the, the Catholic University of uh, Santo Domingo, um, you know, that year, uh, looking at the diplomacy part of it. So this were a very good example of how you can look at something like climate change and get the scientists, the development experts, and the governance people to work together. You know, um, so it's just one project, but they had three, three, three different. Um, okay. Um, so there was also human security and natural disasters. You know, responsibility to protect all of these. You know, each of these would have a component of you know each of those sections. So these are these are just also examples of, of that. Um, then there was the uh, Education for Sustainable Development in Africa, ESDA, which was uh, again very very successful. It was led by by uh, mainly by Pastor Karuchi, but uh, there were also Pastor Nagao, um, Pastor Fubi Nagao, who another Japanese professor who worked with us as a visiting professor. Um, so this was actually supposed to be um, in response to the call by by the UN and UNESCO, you know, to do something for education for sustainable development. So we picked up this team and wanted to work with African universities. So there were universities in Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and Japan to build collaboration. Um, most of them have now set up, you know, special master's uh, programs in development practice, okay? Um, and not, not PhD, just master's, very specialized master's that was supposed to be field best. So um, most of those universities in, in uh, that's the, uh, in Canada, I think there are two universities that are involved in that, and it's quite very strong. The, the UDS in, uh, in Tamale and uh, the the Kwame Nkrumah University Investor of Science and Technology, you know, we are actively involved in that, and the, there was a very strong ties, you know, very strong ties between these universities and their Japanese counterparts, you know, in terms of you know uh, focusing on, on development practice, you know, not just uh, academic uh, academic uh, programs. Uh, this was one thing that uh, a lot of uh, the UNU Council members, uh, you know, talked about. Uh, they liked it, uh, you know, a lot, and uh, you know, they saw it as a good way of doing capacity development. Not just because of the master's program, but it went on for about seven years, and there were very active, you know, uh, components of. There was actually one interesting component of it on, you know, um, building the future generation of researchers in Africa, and these were very young uh, masters and PhD students who actually. You know, had um, um, you know fellowships to they're based in Africa, but you know they come to Tokyo a lot, you know, um, uh, to do exchange with with um, uh, with the peer researchers in the Japanese universities. Okay, um, examples of policy briefs. Uh, that's also um, that was also very one of the things that uh, you know we did very well in that. Now the. Um, the, in education and training, um, again, this was where we had uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, a bit of problems because, like I said, the way that the, the, the graduate programs were introduced, um, were rushed and introduced, um, you know, uh, the, the initial it was quite difficult, you know, to get it started because of the fact that um, we were not properly, you know, sufficiently staffed to do that. Um, but now I think it's running fairly well. So there was those, um, you know, master's and PhD programs on sustainability, development, and peace, and then there was the uh, intensive uh, international course, uh, six weeks intensive uh, courses, um, which you know we are held in Tokyo, and then we brought in, we brought in um, um, external uh, experts uh, from the universities in Tokyo and also universities around the world, you know, to to, to teach uh, in those uh, six. Um, within those six weeks. Um, there was the Education for Sustainable Development in Africa, which I've talked about. Uh, there's the joint graduate courses with Japanese universities. And the one in red is the one that actually was very interesting. Um, when I joined UNU in 2007, um, Max Bond, uh, the executive uh, officer and director's office, had asked me to consider you know, leading um, uh, the UNU Global Seminars in Africa. Uh, the reason being that um, the UNU Council at that time felt that you know the, the UNU operations and activities are not 
you know, visible in developing countries. So they had this chunk of money that was supposed to be devoted to that. So um, it was supposed to be a seminar of a week for young professionals. This could be masters or PhD students on you know, um, um, some of the emerging global issues. Uh, but it has to be held in the developing country, in a developing country. So the first one I did was at the University of Ghana, um, uh, University of Ghana in Accra, and then later we did it at uh, you know, University of Namibia, um, University of Witwatersrand in South, in South Africa, and uh, but I can also talk about Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we had the first one in the Caribbean was at the, uh, the University of West Indies. Now. Um, this was very interesting, you know, because uh, I still receive emails from 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 those young. Uh, they've all gone on now, you know, to for interesting careers. But it was an eye opener for most of them, you know, the kind of questions. So you could see that, you know, we sit in this room, we talk about sustainable development, we sit there, we talk about SDGs, and we're not even talking about how to involve young people. Okay, um, you know, the future belongs to them, and when you capture them young, and some of them have uh, they have a lot of energy. And they keep asking, we just need some, you know, what are we going to do? You know, that's the question, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? So for instance, it ran at the University of Ghana. Um, I did it two or three times at the University of Ghana. Um, and then Namibia was once, uh, South Africa, one to was once, uh, Trinidad and Tobago was there. Uh, it's difficult to plan, but when you get a very good university as a partner, it, the first time is a bit difficult, the second time is much easier, you know. Um, and that's how, we build even now, you know, I still receive emails from some of the the the, the, the professors from the University of Ghana asking me what happened to the global seminars, you know, um, you know, those kind of questions. Um when Professor Ita was vice chancellor, he actually gave a keynote in one of that, in one of those meetings. Um, so so it's something that actually I did and I felt, you know, um, this is one way of doing capacity development. Um, of course we have training fellowships for JSPS, the Japan Society for uh, for the formation of science, the postdoctoral fellows. So, um, I, I just wanted to, pro to, to provoke some ideas, you know. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking last night, you know, 12 years, uh, was, it, was it slavery <laughs> at, at, at UNU? <laughs> uh, we know this uh, award-winning film, yeah? <laughs> Uh, so, um, so I don't know. That's that's the question, you know. Then giving out some of the, you know, the hiccups, um, the transitions, and the you know the uh, some of the uh, uh, the bumpy ride we had, you know, uh, getting certain things started, and you know, and after three four years, you have to you know reverse three sixty degrees and go the other direction. So. Um, so I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it was twelve years a slave. There were a very interesting part of uh, the thing as this picture show. Huh? Do I look like a slave here? Yeah? <laughs> 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 uh, this is the World Bank Forum in uh, in uh, calling for the IIG boots. You know, um, this is the UN uh, Interagency Task Force on the, on the NCDs, um, which I sit on as a UN Youth Focal Point. Uh, two impressive gentlemen, the two best secretary generals we've ever had in the UN. Uh, quote me, I can defend it anywhere. <laughs> um, Kofi Annan and uh, and um, the Swedish guy. You know. <laughs> It's, a, it's always uh, each time I want to pronounce it, uh, how much or uh, how much gold or whatever. So when I say it, I had a Swedish boss when I was delivered. He said, no, he, so he, he taught me how to say it. He said, it's uh, how much or. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so both of them, uh, one one died in active service um, in uh, over uh, a plane crash in Zambia when he was on a peace mission in the Congo in the in the, in the 60s, and he was the youngest ever and the best. You know, uh, he was a very well done diplomat and um, you know, very well beloved. People still talk about him. Okay, so um, this was a meeting in New York. Once you go to, some of us have been to UN headquarters in New York, so there's always that place to see the pictures that. So uh, I, I, I didn't look like a slave here. Yeah? I looked at somebody who was enjoying <laughs> what he was doing. The famous one, Gary Matai, um, one of my favorites, you know, um, environmentalists. This was last year with uh, Botakauchi. 
at the University of Nairobi, the Wangari Hatai Institute. Actually, he actually chairs the, the, the Board of Advisors, uh, Dr. Gautz is the chair of the Board of Advisors. So we had a, a workshop there, um, which he invited me to attend. Um, so, you know, um, Wangari Matai is yes, another inspiring environmentalist who actually did a lot. The uh, AIDS conference, International AIDS conference last year in uh, Amsterdam, um, we had a panel, and immediately after the panel, who was going to speak next? Bill Clinton yes. was supposed to speak uh, on the plenary. And uh, I sat close to his um, his head because he was on the on the panel I, I sat on, and then we talked a lot about uh, uh, some of the what the what the Clinton Foundation was doing. Um, this was just last two weeks ago or three weeks ago in Kampala, the African Centre for Global Health and Social Transformation had a very you know high level um, uh, roundtable on governance and health in Africa. So. Um, a, these are the ones I put at this I think the height of the whole thing was uh, when I sat in a room in 2007 with uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, Ban Ki Moon. Um, there was a meeting on, um, just like there were about 15 of us in the room. I, I showed you that picture, but I couldn't, I showed you the picture, I couldn't uh, upload it on this. So, anyway, um, 15 of us in the room, and he was supposed to advise the Secretary General. He just came in, uh, just resumed uh, Ban Ki Moon as Secretary General, and that was my first day at UNU. And when I came there, it was organized by Council on Foreign Elections. I was shocked. So there are just one, two, three, four, five, six, just two of us. And you have, you know, Mary Robinson, uh, Jimmy Carter, and Ban Ki Moon. And then the, the rest of us, eight of us, were supposed to provoke them and ask them questions. And, you know, so, um, so it hasn't been, it hasn't been slavery. <laughs> you know, to, it has been 12 years of, of, uh, of uh, Now, this picture, when I, when I use it, there's a, somebody from Mexico said, why do you have a Mexican flag? You know, um, so this was when the former Mexican president visited UNU, Calderon, um, and gave a youth lecture. And I was supposed to be, I was asked to be the moderator of that seminar. Um, so I sat on stage with him, and I wanted to, I was looking for the picture I took with him, but I couldn't find it. This was the one that I, so I um, was there for an hour on stage, and you know, so they kept telling me, you know, you can't sit down when the president is talking here. So am I? Am I an ADC or you know a <laughs> security guard or something? Anyway, there are so many of these types of you know uh, seminars, youth lectures that we moderated, and I remember the former president of Senegal, uh, Abdullahi Wad, um, former president of Namibia, and um, president of Costa Rica. So each of them, each of those, I you know I was asked to moderate, facilitate the the, the discussion that went on after the the, the presentation. I remember Dr. Kaluji made a joke once. He was in South Africa. He said. Um, I don't know why they keep asking you to be the facilitator for these uh, presidents and, you know, and uh, so anyway, um, uh, there are, you know, so many of these kinds of things that uh, this is, but um, if you really want to understand, you know, the history of, uh, of a UN, um, I think we, you know, you should pick up, uh, I have two copies of that book, so fortunately I'm going to leave one with the library, you know, when I, before, before I leave. So I think I will leave you at that. Um, in terms of uh, you know um, what next, I am heading back to Canada uh, in the interim um, to my university. I will continue as a visiting research professor there. Um, there are a few things that are being discussed. I don't know yet, you know, how those discussions will uh, will uh, will uh, unfold. But I will be there for the next three, four, five months. Um, but I will also be involved, you know, with the IIGH somehow. Uh, there has, there's quite a lot of unfinished business that Madam Director has uh, asked me to to think about how to continue, uh, you know, helping from outside, and I have I, I will happily accept that invitation. So um, I think I will leave you here. I uh, want to say that um, whatever has a beginning uh, has an end. The um, I remember there was a very interesting debate in in Nigeria those days whether they were going to take IMF loan. And then the president of the country came and said, there's no alternative to IMF loan. And somebody said, no, no, there's alternative to everything. The alternative to life is death. The alternative to, to death is life. So, um, so everything that has a beginning has an end. And um, the journey that started on 1st of September 2007 uh, is ending on 31st of August 2012. Um, so the only thing that is permanent in life itself is change. I have to impress it when it comes. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay.
Sarah from Kuala um, Lumpur. Actually, I was waiting for you to tell us a bit about your, your six years in KL. So, can you just tell us you know, in brief you know, the highlights of your work or your research in KL as it relates to you know, UNU and the Malaysian you know, scenario? Can you just tell us a bit about that? Um, actually, I was supposed to um, do two or three slides on that, you know, uh, on the IGH. But I just felt, um, you know, this was getting okay. Yeah. So, um, so that's why I, 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 the director decided to, and again, you know, um, I think we have to have a frank discussion here. You know, <laughs> the, I, um, I finished my sixth year term in Tokyo, and um, you know, everybody was getting ready to to make a move when he was appointed uh, director of uh, UNU, uh, March first, two thousand and thirteen. I was supposed to to disengage in August, so it comes, and um, there was a transition because because of the former rector had wanted academic officers to stay longer because of the masters and PhD programs. Okay, so um, so when when Dr Malone came, he said no, I want to you know I want you to to be a credible think tank. I want to you know just to scale back on the industry and then. Um, he wanted to stick to the original plan of you know serving six years and you know this but um, he had a discussion with all of us you know all the academic and he said i think what they're doing is unique and i've had i've heard that the institute in in malaysia hasn't been doing very well because um, you know there was the pioneer director who finished anyway finished his time and uh, this so i want to to just strategize that you know there's a new director coming and i think i want you to come and the arrangement was for me to come here for two years, actually. It wasn't, uh, you know, this is, so you go and help, you know, uh, the, the, um, the director of the institute. So it was very difficult for me to, to accept that, actually, you know, um, you know, we had the discussion back and forth. And then uh, eventually when I accepted to do it, so there was a new director that was coming um, from Australia. So I came in from, from Tokyo um, to, to assist him, you know, to, you know, to start a, a new programs. So um, the first thing was that the the first five years of UNU IRGH, and frankly speaking, the first five years of an institute or you know the first five years of you know anything is always difficult. You know you're starting you know this you have to build the platforms and the networks and all of this. Um, so it was supposed to be an international institute for global health, okay? And if it's international, then you have to make it really international. Okay? It's not a Malaysian institute, even though it's located in Malaysia. Now, it's working on global health, not just public health. There are two different things. Okay, so you have to open up that as well. You know, to to connect the institute to the major stakeholders and actors in global health. And these people can be in Geneva, they can be in Chatham House, they could be, you know, you know, all different types of places. So, um, so, so the one I came here. Um, the director had to build a new strategic plan, you know, for, but what he did was, because he came from background of urban health and planetary health, so he wanted to make these, you know, uh, areas very visible in what IHH, you know, was, was, was supposed to be doing. So, so the new um, strategic plan that he prepared um, was overly focused on that, you know, on these two areas. And then he asked me to develop the program on, on governance for global health. So looking at you know the governance components and all of that, I'm happy that Pogamar is here. He's one of the people that uh, you know that, that uh, was very much part of that that he did, that uh, that era you know to the Cape from, from Australia. Um, so IIGH has a lot of promise, and I've always said it, and I say it any day, and I say it even with not tomorrow, next tomorrow I say it. It has a lot of promise. Um, it has. Um, it is we are fortunate to be located in Southeast Asia and in Malaysia especially, okay? A country that actually has done very well in terms of you know, the health systems and, you know, and uh, that's prepared to be a leader in the ASEAN, at least in the ASEAN region. You know, a lot of you know, countries look up to Malaysia, you know, the less developed countries in the, in the region. Um, so how do you handle this potential? That's the real question. How do you handle this potential? So in my view, the first five years, um, we actually, you know, as they said, you know, we point below our weights. Okay, um, it wasn't properly run as, you know, uh, an issue for global health. Yeah, there were so many things they did, 
which were very, very good. You know, there were so many programs, so many, uh, you know, things that you don't have, economies and case mix and all of those kind of, you know, they were very good that you can, you know, in go to any university that has expertise on those, they tell you that this is very good work. But you need to go to the next level. You know, you need to, people, even in Southeast Asia, need to know about IIGH. The liver needs to know about IIGH, you know. If you are really an institute of global health, you know, that deliver is where it happens, you know, that's where they are the health institutions, WHO, you know, they say that's where they are, you know. Um, so how do you actually do that? That's the key question. So there has also been a whole lot of, uh, so it has promise, it's not very well known, it's not very well recognized, the work is good, but it's focusing on other things that maybe, you know, universe, other computer universities will be doing. So as a think tank in the UN system, how do you actually, you know, uh, push it to the level where if so, there's a discussion happening in Geneva, they so there's an institute in Malaysia that does this kind of work, you know, and we have to consult them. Um, so that, that's the real question. Um, so it has been uh, to, to help to build, uh, I'm very proud of what we did, for instance, you know, for one of the examples, um, when Margaret Chan was the DG of the PHO, you know, she wrote to Dr. David Malone, the director in Tokyo, and said, you know, we want to, want UNE to be part of the UN Intelligence Task Force on NCDs. And, you know, we joined, we've done, you know, uh, quite a bit with them. And it's within those 24 agencies that compose that type, that task force. They know about UNE. You know, uh, when they do, you know, they want to initiate programs, they ask for our opinion, we ask for our comments, our advice, and all of that. Um, there are quite a couple of things that were done, but I think we need to, Get to the next level, and that is what has happened in the past. I would say in the past, you know, two to three years. Again, um, there's a lot of transition here, you know, because after Capon stepped down, there was an interim period of about two years, and then, you know, um, before uh, was a lot of was uh, a lot of was uh, recruited. So the institute has undergone uh, a scenario review. There's now a new strategy plan in place. And there are those pillars, you know, is what we have to look at, you know, going uh, as a way forward. And I think from the way things have gone, have gone, I mean, you know, that visibility will, is already there, actually, you know, because uh, depending on who you talk to, you know, um, people know about IIGH. Uh, so how strategically, going forward, you know, uh, how do you actually make it better? That's, you know, there's always room for improvement. Director's office will be able to <laughs> go to uh, to uh, this. Uh, that institute in Senegal, you know, uh, eventually wanted to become uh, a full fledged institute of its own. But you know, there's a lot of funding issues, you know, monetary issues and these things, you know, um, and about pay paying the endowment funding. I don't know what it is, but uh, that initially was started with from merit, you know, merit and, you know, so that's the twin institute. In fact, UNUISP um, had to play with UNU era at that time, you know, so. Uh, what Osawada wanted was for every UN institute to have a twin partner in a developing country. And he was very, you know, he was very um, uh, uh, resolute on that. So there were quite a lot of this kind of arrangements, you know, that, um, you know, but again, uh, like I said, the definition of what a twin institute or that twin arrangement was, wasn't, it wasn't fleshed out, you know, uh, well. So people were doing twin in different ways, in different, uh, very different ways. Uh, so that uh, that is why it hasn't it hasn't um, there's no much traction in it now you know yeah. until you end it. Yes. As, as you know, I, I'm looking at IIGH, yeah? and uh, the UN has the WHO as its lead agency for health, and then we have IIGH. Do you see any conflict, or how does IIGH established an identity separate from WHO, from your experience from the other sectors, what would you advise? Oh yeah, there's, uh, the, the, the difference is, is so clear. I mean, um, WHO is the leading agency for, for health, yeah, you know, we all know that. But programs, okay, the mainly programs, uh, 
with countries. Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, policy elaboration as well. You know uh, where they can a lot of resolutions and you know uh, this and that where the guidelines and standard setting. You know that's WHO's function. Um, IHH is a think tank. You know um, our job is okay, there's a lot of research going on in WHO. For instance, uh, um, tropical disease research and you know all of that. Um, but we are such institutes, a think tank in the UN system. Um, I don't really think there's any conflict, you know, in the, in the this thing, because our mandate is very clear. So our job is to be where I understand it. If there's any policy that WHO has wants countries to, you know, to implement, we can actually help, you know, to do that um, by you know these workshops and you know this thing. So take for instance tobacco, just one example. We all know that there's a, you know the, the framework convention on tobacco control. Food says a whole lot of things, okay? There's a whole lot of things that, you know, that convention wants countries to do, to put in place for tobacco control. Um, IIGH can pick one, any of those. So for instance, it can be advertising of cigarette to minors, it could be issues of smuggling, it could be taxation on you know, this, it could be, you know, um, this. So we can actually build capacity in countries on some of those uh, issues that we have expertise. So, um, I, I, I've done the bit on, on tobacco control myself, you know, I was part of the, the when I was about that, the village, that when the, when the negotiations were going on. So I know some of the key, you know, uh, this thing. So, um, so if you want to do, look at it from capacity building perspective, we can actually pick it up and say, you know, one component of that, even though this is a WHO convention, we can help to build cap uh, capacity for countries to be able to implement that, you know, not all of it, but, you know, some bits and bits for research. Um, the way it will be done is, for instance, if you want to do something in, say, Vietnam, I'll give you an example, you know, we have to first of all identify a local partner. This could be a research institute or a university. You know, we elaborate the, what you want to do, you know, the concept note and, you know, this, and then it takes about a few months to plan. And that's how these things are produced, you know, uh, policy briefs and, you know, those kind of things. So, um, so those are the two ways, you know, that, uh, but the place you can go in, in Vietnam, and we've got advice health ministers, you know, on how to regulate advertising, how to, you know, uh, do any of those that this thing, any of those. Things. So I think the mandate is slightly different, um, you know, and um, there's no competition at all, you know, <laughs> in, my, in my view. We are, we are very small, you know, but uh, we have ideas on how, you know, capacity can be built or how research can be, can be conducted. So WHO focuses mainly on programs and standard setting. Can I add just a little yeah. bit to that? I think it's an important question. Um, and uh, while there are challenges that most people probably have heard of with the restructuring with WHO, one of the advantages for us is that we have an MOU with WHO, which links directly to the science, the, the, the newly created science division within WHO. So we work directly with the, with the group within WHO that is about the generational evidence um, and the translation of that evidence to policy. So that, that means that we, it is very much an extension of the work that they do and a support for a complementary function um, for them rather than any, any uh, notion of, of rivalry or competition. Okay, um, we're going to torture you for a bit more uh, <laughs> this afternoon, but I won't subject everybody else to it because it, it is almost one o'clock and people are probably hungry. So um, for those who are not part of IIGH who would like to engage with um, OB, um, the 